about KDD. Uh, what time do we have to come back? Uh, in half an hour or um, more more time for the next session? Uh, the next session is Pacific time, 1 p.m. Okay, so that means in uh, 30 minutes. So we only have 30 minutes. I grabbed a sna uh, snack bar already. Um, so whoever wants to join and uh, turn on your your video camera. All right, so can I actually share my screen? Uh, you probably, you should. Okay. Oh, you have a what? Uh, oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm just uh, sharing this and uh, whoever want to Talk and uh, grab the uh, grab the microphone and uh, start chatting. Um, just for your information, I just put on the link to BioKDD in there. It's a general link that listed the, our history since uh, 2001. Uh, I also put out my definition of what BioKDD is. Feel free to criticize. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can just discuss everything about you and your opinion about BioKDD. Who wants to start first? Uh, is Da here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Well, maybe as organizers and uh, Da Hong, I'm not sure Tsai Yun is here. Um, can you each uh, just talk I'm about uh, your own? Yeah, oh, great. Your own research and uh, just follow the structure and see who wants to join. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, my, my research area is in data science and the big data analytics. So I also uh, work a little bit on the biomedicine data, uh, like uh, uh, the like uh, a DNA sequence, uh, you know, also the medical imaging. But uh, my real focus is still like um, my real expertise is still on like uh, uh, data science, where we use like deep learning techniques and. Uh, machine learning models uh, to tackle problems modeled as like uh, classification regression or any like clustering those kind of problems and uh, uh, on the like uh, so I'm in the database and data mining field so on the database side I develop uh, uh, like algorithms uh, with non-trivial uh, you know bonds or pruning techniques and I also uh, work on distributed programming and how to speed up those kind of processing using many, many machines. And I know that in uh, bioinformatics, a lot of data are in graph form, especially multi-omic data. And uh, so also like uh, there is a literature, like uh, knowledge graph data where we extract all kinds of concepts, entities. And I think uh, uh, my research can uh, kind of help in this area. And uh, I think uh, maybe something related to like knowledge graph, uh, I see a lot of, uh, like ontology uh, and uh, automatic extraction of like uh, meaningful uh, entities in, uh, in biology, in, in the literature may be useful. Uh, and uh, my, my research can help in that aspect. And uh, so, uh, so for, for major opportunities for BioQDD, I think uh, especially these days, uh, we can see that uh, the concept of data science, especially deep learning, has been uh, sweeping the whole research area, right? So if you look at those kind of AI community there, uh, that community has grown super big uh, from like, usually in the old days, I think maybe 100 or 200 papers. Now they have like a thousand papers per year. And uh, so if you look at the computer vision area, like uh, uh, for, for example, Kai Ming He has uh, one paper, like a rest map, the citation is already 50,000 times even just uh, since 2016. And uh, so 
And there's a lot of uh, research in deep learning that can be used uh, uh, specifically to the uh, you know, biomedicine research. For example, if you look at uh, sequence models like a recurrent neural network, uh, including also like a natural language processing can be used for like a, a parsing uh, the literature for knowledge graphs, for building, for example, et cetera. And also if you look at computer vision, I think a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, about biomedical applications, uh, like about, uh, imaging data, right? Like uh, MRI and CT and this kind of uh, PET data. Uh, for object recognition, as right, they say, have been a lot of breakthrough, like Mars Calcian, like uh, the YOLO, uh, I think like YOLO V3 and these kind of models has been quite mature. Like you can, uh, with, with people doing a lot of uh, annotation, then you can automatically detect tumors. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so I, I, my, my understanding about uh, uh, the field is that uh, if we want to work on medical data, there are two kinds. One is really whether we touch upon biology, right? So uh, if you, you just uh, look at a lot of the imaging data, we don't need biology. We, it's more like a, the, the pure AI people, they can do that. But I think the more important part is uh, uh, for data mining researchers to really learn the sufficient biology and knowledge and uh, be able to work with like uh, the, the omics data, et cetera. And that will, I think, uh, be where uh, the, the research folks could be. Uh, for example, uh, yesterday I went to the, to the uh, tutorial uh, I forgot the name. It's something related to healthcare. Uh, yeah, yeah. Healthcare. Graph, so, graph, you know, graph. graph analytics for healthcare by uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Jian Pei was uh, uh, like leading this. Uh, yeah, uh, three pounds, three yeah, I, I see that the last uh, part is very interesting. If you look at their, they're constructing like a chemical. I, I think uh, uh, there's a neural network to grow, explore different kind of structures. I guess it's uh, reinforced learning. I don't. Exactly follow, but uh, that's quite interesting and it's non trivial if you don't know like about chemistry well, you will not be able to design this like the uh, structure searching uh, deep learning models uh, effectively. Like most people just are using uh, naive feature structures these days, like uh, whether it's recurring neural transformers or you know, uh, count nets or graph convolution nets, etc. It's, it's still quite straightforward in most of the world, right? So, whether we can really have the, the models deep into the uh, biological process, and that could be an important uh, direction that people can look into. Um, yeah, so this is potentially okay, right. yeah. Um, right. so, yeah, anyone else? Uh, we, we only have 30 minutes, so let's uh, just uh, hear as many uh, opinions as possible. I would uh, yield the priority to those who turn on their videos. Uh, Jianhua, how are you in Pittsburgh? I think you're muted. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm quite new to, to uh, this community. So, um, but I noticed a uh, uh, sort of background in physics, right? Da. Oh, my, my background? Yeah. No, no, I, I mean computer science. <laughs> no, no, who, who, I thought who, some of you guys oh, got a PhD in physics. Oh, so, so you are talking about the, the keynote speaker for the afternoon, maybe uh, Je Jeffrey? Uh, Probably, I know, I, I thought I checked on this. So here, I, I'm going to say, you know, this is, uh, I'm very thanks for her, thank you guys for bringing, uh, you know, uh, inviting me to be in this community. And uh, well, I, but my research indeed uh, used a lot of data. Got the more, you know, especially uh, at the very beginning and uh, more on, on this uh, physical science, you know, try to use the physics perspective and engineering. You put here, I think uh, uh, Jake just mentioned here engineering things, right? To uh, study biological process. And also I agree with uh, exactly like said, we not just look at the data, look at the things, but we also emphasize biology. In order to really, we, we put have impact really uh, got, you know, uh, contribute to understanding, we have to understand the biology. So this is, I, I think I share really a uh, similar philosophy with Jake and other people. Um, so I'm very happy, uh, you know, uh, thanks for, for, for uh, being included in, in this uh, workshop. 
and uh, I learned a lot. Yeah. So what would you uh, think that we should do in the future to at least have some kind of a unique uh, branding to it? Because uh, many people are in this space, as you know, from bioinformatics, from medical informatics, mathematical biology, algorithm biology. We heard all those buzzwords all these past years. So we were sticking to the same name for the past uh, 20 years. <laughs> what what do you think that the that we should continue to do or change as a result of what you see? Well, this is a big question, huh? Because you have your brand name here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I no, I'm not sure I would suggest you change the name thing. But the, I do notice, right? Uh, you know, there are a lot of informatics community, bigger than that community, a lot of things about data science here. I think you, your unique emphasis on um, this integration between the data science and uh, the true question, right? This is uh, something you should really uh, continue to advocate. Okay. And, and also how, I mean, I'm not sure besides this platform, what other similar, you know, like a, uh, organizations, uh, conference, community, you guys try to reach out? So I don't know about them, but uh, I tend to go to the KDD as one major meeting, uh, ISMB, that's about informaticians, yeah. uh, and AMIA, that's a medical informatics. So somewhere, uh, and then of course, the many IEEE conferences that's uh, covering different topics. and. Um, but this one is uh, we're talking about bioinformatics in the data science community. So we're the minority, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But we hope also bring the messages we learned here to the bioinformatics community and talk about the, the new tools we found from KDD to ISMB, for example, or AMIA. But it's, it's very, it's very interesting to see that different community talk uh, have different emphasis. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure you're aware of, there is a recent uh, uh, controversy in uh, ANSEF when they actually, uh, in a program, they say they want to emphasize on uh, artificial intelligence, particularly uh, those things. That's in the ANSEF GRSP, computational, it turned out that the people from the domain science factory are strongly against that. <laughs> uh, my own experience when uh, I, I often send my own research proposal to the domain science panel, it turned out that even though uh, we, I thought I said we like deep learning, it turned out when uh, the domain science panel reviewed they are more emphasized on the biological relevance. So when they see deep learning, they will say, what kind of, why do we even need it here? <laughs> so, I, would, uh, I, I guess the, the biologists, uh, when I sent my research proposal, most of them probably are still a, a classically trained biologists. When they see the data science, deep learning, all those things, they will, have a first question of why do we, why is this, this person applying that approach here? So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a very good observation. Actually, uh, the culture will change more slowly. So I think uh, this is, we're still at the beginning phase. Uh, this may not uh, be continued in the future. That's uh, my first point. And second is, uh, I think uh, when you look at the, how biology is done, it's very, very deep. So uh, for example, when I pointed out in my slides, uh, the biology, uh, you have a human protein atlas database that's well-funded, mm -hmm. well-influential. But when you get to this ACE2 in long, obviously they were not sequencing the round tissue and that miss AT2, which is a majority cell type in long. And therefore, they miss the uh, gene expression with quality that uh, 
problem everywhere, the biologists usually would argue for first collecting data and doing experimental validation and hypothesis generation first. Mm -hmm. So NIH is using a model that say, okay, we'll find a lot of biologists and then go digging out the individual biology, get the data, and then at least let them share the data. Now, I think if you go to NIH, they're starting to find the secondary analysis of data set now. So you can get NIH R21 funding just by doing computational analysis. And then, the, and then it's people like us who will be in those panels. So that's an improvement. But um, those, those secondary analysis or pen disease studies are still minority because uh, the urgency is to treat the disease. But I would say in the future, when you have systemic diseases like COVID that requires whole body orchestration or like autoimmune disease, cancer, they're all very similar, then I think in the future, we're gonna see changes that will also reflect it at NSF. Yeah, and uh, I'm new to BioKDD, but uh, to be honest, uh, I like the format of Lucy here BioKDD. I mean, like, uh, I, unfortunately, I missed the workshop yesterday or last weekend, and but uh, my naive sense is uh, probably BioKDD, there are so many bioinformatics or informatics conference uh, and uh, every year. So this year, I think BioKDD, um, is promising that it captured the hot spot, like a COVID-19 discussion in the conference. And so in future format, maybe we have a, like, a, we just follow this year's format. We have a three options. Um, I mean, like a three parts. The first one is a workshop. Workshop can like teach people and about their advanced technology in depending AI, whatever. And the the presentation, like uh, we may have a two separate presentation. One is uh, for the traditional one, for all topic about the uh, informatics, uh, data science, or new novel method or tools to apply it to like uh, biology, medicine, healthcare, whatever. And the other one is more like uh, this year's COVID nineteen. We capture each year hotspot in advance and try to organize uh, several talks and something. But I think another challenge is uh, how can you encourage people to attend the meeting? I mean, like uh, some conferences, they can they have a connection with uh, some juniors with a little bit of high impact factor, and then they can select and publish some talks or papers accept for the conference, something like that. I, I, I don't know, and I mean, like, uh, it must cost much effort from organizers, but probably it, it is, I mean, like, we should think about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, of course, uh, getting uh, people like yourself uh, to come and present, that's one way uh, to, to do this. In the future, um, well, I think uh, we were able to attract a very diverse uh, group because it's virtual. And mm -hmm. in the future, uh, it's more likely going to come back to a regular format. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we should, even in the future, have a balanced uh, on-site and virtual presentation to leverage on the untapped community that wouldn't want to, wouldn't normally want to go to a KDD. I think onsite is a, is a better option. It can encourage people to communicate and uh, try to look for potential collaborations, something. But uh, the workshop, I think workshop would probably, I, the online training is better for the workshop. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll work out with the, uh, the conference logistic. Uh, this is the first year they allow us to go for virtual and I enjoy virtual. <laughs> okay, uh, they're not able to collect a lot of the conferencing fees, but um, if this is a trend in the future, then we should yeah. not fight it. The virtual presentation is a little bit of a challenge. I mean, like uh, I personally prefer 
I contact with the audience uh, when I do presentation, but virtual, I can see nothing, only my slides. <laughs> uh, one question is uh, how, uh, how long we can keep those uh, put, uh, presentation video? Like, uh, can we promote those presentation video on social media or can we keep them public? Uh, what's, what, what's the policy dealing with those presentation videos? Yeah. I think that I saw that uh, a lot of the yesterday's content are already posted on individuals' uh, YouTube channel. So I know Hong is, you are very uh, well known for posting bioinformatics YouTube uh, ch uh, content. So we rely on you to guide us how we can promote the uh, maybe bio KDD, we should get a, uh, get a channel as well. And then we sort of put our content there. What do you think that and uh, Taiyun? I think uh, KDD itself will put up these videos as far as I know, because if you look at it, it's uh, actually recording. Uh, but uh, how do we get these videos uh, for our own promotion or they will uh, put it up somewhere uh, as a hub for our own success? Uh, maybe that's we need to uh, uh, ask the, the, the conference organizers. This is what I'm thinking. Actually, uh, when I attended, uh, for example, ICDE, after a couple of days, they actually, uh, after the conference, they actually have all the videos up there and they actually have a, all the papers there uh, and a computer or all. And uh, so it's not the regular, you know, the IEEE library, but uh, I think they, they just put every PDF there with the links that you can easily access by clicking the conference links. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit different. KDD is not encouraging us to share the, the link to the public and they also have the repairs where maybe due to security reasons. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, definitely we need to uh, share those videos, those talks, uh, especially uh, like, uh, I, I think all these talks have a very high quality and if we can share on YouTube videos and everyone can watch and then the impact of uh, not only about KDD and also all the speakers here uh, will be better advertised and people can watch offline whenever they want. So yeah, we, we can talk to KDD organizers and see how we can get this video. I think it would be really interesting to see this uh, presentation video online. For example, uh, I'm coming from the visualization community and it has we have been done this for five or six years already. So for the IEEE visualization conference, uh, after the conference, we put all the presentation video on Vimos and I think now it becomes a database. Every people can actually search uh, whatever paper has been present there and watch the video. Since it's, I mean, it's not always possible to visit the conference and you can, be, and we also have parallel track uh, during the conference, it's not possible that you listen to all the presentation, uh, even though you participate the conference. So I think it definitely, we will see to put uh, all those videos online. And I actually very appreciate that Dad invited me to join this organization team because this gave me an opportunity to uh, extend my network to uh, data mining community. And today I think I learned a lot uh, about the, the, the database and everything. Uh, yeah, regarding bio KDD. So actually I also try to promote the, um, the workshop to, to people in, in our community. And I think most of, some of them are uh, sh showing their interest, but due to the pandemic this year, they wasn't able to submit any paper. But I think it, it would be also worthy to somehow advertise the, the workshop uh, to different relevant community and try to engage more uh, people from different uh, domains to increase the participants here would be nice or kind of a future uh, target at least expect. So Amkar, I see you have your video turned on. Would you like to make some comments? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think actually video is a good uh, way. Actually, we, we, we can also break them into four sessions uh, that are closely related with each session. And uh, actually, if you look at these days, uh, in, in old days, uh, people write uh, 
like uh, books that are like the state of the art, everyone wants to read those books, right? But now if you look at what's happening in online education, like so we, uh, this is yeah, all videos, like 10 minutes videos. And usually also what I do research, if there's a complicated concept, I just uh, uh, like go to YouTube and uh, search whether somebody actually shoot that video, get very clear, uh, like a pictorial, uh, you know, uh, illustration of the concepts. This is especially well illustrated in, I think in biology, for example, a lot of concepts, they make all kinds of animation, those concepts. Right? So mm -hmm. it's very impressive, 3D animations. And uh, for computer science, actually, this is the same thing compared with watching or reading a whole paper. Right? Uh, if you have 10 minutes video and you get the main idea, I think that's much faster and uh, can broaden the impact of uh, your work really quickly uh, to, to other people. But do you feel like uh, as a field, the BioKDD is uh, experiencing any bottleneck for all of the people here? Uh, because yesterday, at least uh, I look at a lot of the, the newer techniques um, and keep thinking that, that uh, in this community, we come up with all these techniques and we think that we can solve problem faster, cheaper. Um, and then in the medical community, even though people are recognizing the future practice in medicine is going to be AI driven and data driven. But uh, when you go to any hospital here and their actual practical version of AI is nothing comparable to what we're talking about here. Right, so that maybe AI is just dictation device, automatically record this uh, voice into a transcript and enter into EMRs. And the peop uh, doctors are still struggling to deal with electronic uh, medical system entering the data accurately. So there's a huge disconnect. Um, how, how can we actually make impact? You know, I think what we've got though is if, uh, like, like we also uh, together write the ground, right? So uh, if you talk to people uh, like in different kind of uh, departments in the hospital and say, yeah, kind of sensitive about the data they can share. And uh, if you don't have data sharing, that, that, that's a bigger trouble. Let's say if, you, let's say if we, we want to detect a certain kind of disease, if you have all those kind of CT images, if we all put it together, then we, we can train a very powerful model. So it, it, there's a progress like a transfer learning, uh, not transfer learning, it's, it's a federated learning, where everyone just uh, train their part of the data and uh, share the intermediate features, which do not disclose individual data of the patients uh, together and for, for the second stage co training. And, and, but I, I still feel there are people are not quite sure whether they will be disclosed. And I think the, the privacy issue mm -hmm. is a major hurdle in this area, especially, I mean, no one wants to share their whole like a DNA sequence or, you know, all kinds of information with other people that can manipulate on the uh, so, so, and uh, the hospitals are a little bit worried about this kind of uh, like, uh, whether it's their responsibility and, you know, so, uh, there's, a, there's a hurdles here from my perspective is, uh, to utilize mm -hmm. large amounts of data for AI. And if you look at deep learning these days, it's really, it's really saying, hey, it's uh, previously people use maybe the still of SVN and there's certain people stick to the uh, direction of neural networks. And then suddenly the GPU comes and, uh, you know, and there's the image net and then suddenly people find how neural network really performs much better and they, they construct more and more complicated stuff. And they feel all kinds of data. So you have more bigger models of more powerful hardware and you need a bigger data. Right? So if you don't have, let's say, image net, you will never uh, you know, be get, catching attention. You know? right? So uh, it's the same if you have uh, medical data that can scale and with a lot of annotations that the deep learning models can utilize, uh, that will definitely help, but uh, there's a privacy for those from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, so I've been sitting on both sides of the fence and I can also say that, that there's also a distrust from the mm -hmm medical side to the so-called computer scientists who, whose main interest is not in biology and medicine. 
So there are two, uh, I'm gonna make an analogy. There are two ways of mining. Uh, one is uh, you can say the agriculture mining, well, you have a, a corn field where you can use machinery, harvest all the corn, and uh, almost every crop is fully utilized. Another type of mining is uh, maybe rare metal mining. You go to a mountain, you know that the rare metal is only a tiny percentage of the uh, earth's soil. So you go there, you destroy everything, you burn and bomb the, uh, the field, and then you use a chemical, pollute the land, and then you extract whatever you want to extract, you leave. So if there's a first type and people in the medical field want to collaborate with you because they need to take care of every patient, every patient matters, whether you mind to them to be meaningful or not. But then sec if the second type, you just come in and then take say, oh, I'm making argument for 1% of patient and then I'm publishing a paper. What about the other 99% that also needs a solution? So I think that, that there's a different mentality there. And in order to be successful, we need to be very sensitive, um, caring for every case. Uh, I don't think we are there yet with data science. Oh, hey, Jack. Yeah. Uh, this is a California time, uh, looks like uh, 12 o'clock. It looks like one, uh, we actually have one hour to go for the next section. Oh, okay. Then we can just uh, have everyone just uh, go grab their lunches and um, chat whatever you want. We also have a lot of silent students in here. Yeah. I would uh, just uh, say that we'll leave this here. Uh, people can just uh, come and go and just uh, networking. This is a truly networking event. Okay. Yeah. So. I'm going to go grab some food. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think we have still have one, one hour, and then I think uh, Dr. Jeffrey Fox uh, will give the keynote. And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, let's let's do that. Uh, we, we we yeah, let's do that on time. Uh, then the, the the speakers can know what time they show up. I guess yeah. 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 Okay, probably I'll take that. I'll also finish here maybe fifteen minutes uh, fifteen minutes earlier and check with all the. Uh, speakers of session three and uh, make sure you are actually here so you can smoothly run on to uh, go on to the third session thank you uh, you are the next chair are you yes yeah. you are the next chair. Yeah, i'm the next chair but uh, i think uh, uh, what i would do is uh, because uh, dr wu will be here for for the host uh, workshop right so because i have a right. first machine learning class to teach uh, from, uh, I see. Okay. yeah so so I, I right after the session so i have to uh, uh, leave early. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. this is the first class. Uh, we just begin our semester. So, yeah, so uh, maybe I will make uh, Dr. Wu the host. And then, uh, in case I cannot finish the last talk, which is unlikely, uh, my feeling is, but uh, then, then maybe Dr. Wu will have to help, help handle the last talk, maybe. Mm -hmm. Can you make me a co host? Oh, so, so yeah, so I, I think right now you, you just. Uh, uh, convert the host to me, right? So I, I will make uh, Dr. Wu the host, and everyone else will be the co host here. Yeah, okay, think. good. Yeah. So, let, let, let me just do Okay, see you. Uh, okay, yeah, so so I think uh, Dr. Wu is now the host. I see, okay. Okay. Uh, then, uh, then I will make the others co-host. Wait a second. I, I think uh, all, no, all no. are already co-host. Right? I mean, yeah. No, they, uh, once you go back to the host like that, it, it changed back to default, it looks like. Oh, let, let, let me see. Uh, uh, make his co-host. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Wu just changed us back to co-host. I see. Uh, I think Dr. Chin has another account, right? So it's yeah, yeah. I I'm using my regular account just to see what my screen looks like from the. Okay. Is that account also to be uh, co-host? Oh, no, 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 no. That's my iPad. Uh, yeah, that's that's just okay. testing. In fact, I can close it. Uh, yeah. 
Sure. I think we can also uh, make uh, Dr. Geoffrey Fox uh, uh, a co-host because he will be the invited uh, speaker for, for the next session. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So do we have any students in here who would like to chat about uh, probably your first experience at uh, BioKDD? Uh, we actually have a high school student here. Oh, really? Whoa. <laughs> and you show your face? We want to say hi. Our first year college student. Uh, okay. Hey, Erna, are you there? <clears throat> uh, maybe she's not uh, at the computer right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I see some of my students. So are you guys uh, just starting to take uh, online, uh, I mean, uh, teach online or in person for this semester? Uh, we, we teach hybrid, uh, in person and online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are people concerned about the in teaching, uh, in person teaching? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are recording, so I, <laughs> I would say no comment. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> Yeah, you had a summer camp, and at one point I was uh, thinking about sending students to your summer camp. Oh, yeah. That goal, uh, did, you, did it get canceled or? No, they are all online. Uh, I, I use online. So. Yeah. yeah, so we were really interested in some general uh, bioinformatics training. Uh, we're at the uh, medical school setting. Many of the students are quite gifted. But uh, also, many of them are uh, wet lab biologists. Uh, oh. Do you think that, that they should uh, find some link? You can send us some link, and people can take your courses, uh, get uh, basic computational right. biology skills. It depends on what do they want to learn, because bioinformatics uh, skill is a very uh, broad. So yeah, well, I mean, just the basic stuff. And uh, in your in your summer camp, mm -hmm. do you teach them basic programming, R, Python? Yeah, or do you teach them uh, RNA seq analysis. No, we we are not going too very specific because RNA seq analysis not every student will need them. Uh, but R and the Python coding is kind of a general skill. So in a way, yeah. So, but if the student work on RNC, they will obviously learn that in their own lab. Yeah. Uh, do you have medical school there in the child? So, the medical school at Tennessee is at the Memphis. I see. Yeah, I think you're only two hours away from us and we haven't actually visited each other before the, uh, the COVID. That's incredible. I met you at uh, uh, Birmingham uh, maybe in uh, 2018. For oh, the, that's a, for that's the, our, oh the, the annual symposium. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 But, uh, my postdoc actually, Hallboy, is also uh in the chat now <laughs> yeah you actually talked to my poster at uh, in front of his poster okay yeah so. yeah yeah i i remember so is he uh somewhere now or still with you he is with me now but uh my grand will end the early uh spring uh, next year spring next year so we are still uh, I'm looking for funding, but uh, I think he or should also look for the next <laughs> position. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I do have some funding for cardiovascular bioinformatics work. Uh, okay. If you think that uh, that this is potentially suitable for him, and that we can chat about it. I see. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we might talk uh, separately. Uh, okay. All right. I'm not. Uh, So, Xiaoyun, uh, what time is it in Austria? 
Are you in Austria? Yes, I'm in Vienna. So it's not nine, nine in the evening. Nine in the evening. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I already drank enough coffee before, so it should be fine until the end. <laughs> wow. So in normal time, uh, so there will be lots of concert. And now I heard that at least uh, in my city, the orchestra is just being furloughed and they haven't played in real life for nine months. Is it also true in Vienna? Yes, it's also true here. But now uh, some of the organization, they try to uh, organize in a way that uh, it's outside and uh, every, everyone has can, if they keep their own social distance, that is allowed to do it in certain degree, but usually with a very small number of people. So yeah, unfortunately. But on the other side, um, for example, like the Vienna Opera House, now they offer some free program. You can also watch it online. <laughs> Maybe it's not as promising as watching in the opera, but at least something. Yeah, I know that the music has to be, the, the beauty of uh, orchestra music is the uh, interaction part. Otherwise, yeah. it's not a, like a real life performance. When the musician do something, like all of a sudden deviating from the routine and add another uh, song, that's where the exciting part of the concert is. <laughs> true, <laughs> that is true, but this is not happening for a few months already. I don't know when they are going to, yeah, allows us to do it again, but right now, yeah. And in our university, we are also kind of half closed. Although the employees are able to go to the university, but the students usually don't. And for the next semester, we are still teaching online. So, oh. and it's very hard for me. I find it very hard to control students. If they are not showing up, you don't know them. They don't know you. They are more likely to be shy and not saying anything. <laughs> Uh, are you in the computer science department? Yes, I'm in the computer science department, okay. specializing in computer graphics, so. Yeah, uh, I thought that the computer science is better. Maybe informatics is better. Um, for my group, uh, I felt that they are more productive during the, the lockdown because we are not just using the, the Linux and Unix operating system, we're actually using Windows and all of these uh, team communication tools like Zoom or uh, Slack and Microsoft Teams and all of these uh, online tools that came in the past uh, 10 years are helping the team to be really tightly connected. If I were using only Emacs <laughs> and uh, and the old style, the computer science tool, and I, I would say, yeah, that's, that's probably bad because I can't, I don't know what they're doing unless I, I see their product. I think you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. So I think for all those uh, virtual conference things stuff are very nice, but I still find it very challenging if you, I need to somehow discuss technical uh, issue with my students or with uh, my colleague. Sometimes you need to draw something, you need to write equation and using mouse or using those tablets, sometimes not optimal, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. And yeah, and I think it's more, uh, I don't know, it's engage people's more. If you have a whiteboard, you can write yeah. things. So you see, that's why I bought something like this. Right, so I can uh, write here, uh, and then uh, this is something that I use. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I'm just going to uh, demonstrate. Um, yes, I think Zoom has a function. You can write something. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I write a bio KDD. And it's actually, in my opinion, is better because I can overlay my notes Mm -hmm. directly on top of the presentation content. I can take picture, I can save it, I can assign the task. So, mm -hmm. but in order to do that, you have to actually deviate from uh, 
a Linux centric way of doing things, but then be more like an office uh, centric. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm also not a Windows user anymore, yeah. so I'm <laughs> I'm struggling a lot with this, and I was yeah. I'm using Mac at home, so I'm using iPad and try to uh, record the the screenshot. <laughs> yeah, I, I was trying a lot at the beginning when we locked down. But I think uh, still they also like this kind of uh, writing on the slide style better than than just talking over a voice over the slide. Hmm. Yeah, it would be nice that <laughs> somebody can share some some technical details about this. So I so think you, the annotation is super nice. I mean, I can just draw and cross out something, and if uh, there's also textbook, we can just type a formula, mm -hmm. etc. And uh, I, I think if you use LaTeX, the formula you can use some online LaTeX mathematic formula for you know real time rendering then. That's yeah, they have problem. those software. Yeah, so I, I think all these technical difficulties can be overcome. Actually, at least the way working with my PhD students is more efficient. I don't have to go to the office. I just say, hey, let's do a meeting. And then, then they, they connect and then we, we discuss and the, uh, just like a plot anywhere. Right? And then we can erase, erase all mm -hmm. and we plot. And uh, I do find it, uh, actually, if you get used to it, it's like everything become digital, digitalized. Right? So, and if you spend enough time uh, mastering the techniques, it's going to be way more efficient than if you discuss, especially if you look at a class. I think uh, some students actually like a remote class. You think about, uh, like, I teach machine learning as a Henry student, for example. And uh, mm -hmm. our class is like a, a very long classroom with maybe 20 uh -huh. rows. And you think about the experience for the last row students. Some of them cannot hear clearly and uh, cannot see the uh, blackboard clearly, right? So, but that all these problems just disappear if you use Zoom. So I think uh, actually this is, uh, in some aspect is good, but uh, in other aspects, uh, just like eye contact and whether you, mm -hmm. you are aware of students, not your PhD student. PhD student, when you discuss with them, they have to pay attention. Right? So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> for, for the uh, regular students, right? So if they, mm -hmm. if they have difficulty pay attention, if they become remote, this may be even more difficult, right? So. Uh, but there's a like uh, I think there's a grid view, right? So we can see everyone's face, and then if uh, I, I don't think whether it will work out for Henry students, but uh, yeah, you you so, are not going to watch a hundred students' face. Yeah, it's like a panel, and then this is yeah. actually viewable, I think. and you can see everyone's face clearly using the grid view. But do 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 students interact with you uh, during your courses? Which I mean this virtual courses because for us it's like we only have for each course course we only have 20 to 30 people so it's more easy to interact with them oh, in the so classroom so they use the chat so they ask a question uh, i have to mm -hmm. click and see oh that's a question that i answer them i, I mean ah, okay. uh, yeah but, but see, actually i don't uh, limit this they can just unmute and talk i just like in the classroom mm -hmm. but, yes they, they prefer to chat maybe uh, they are shy <laughs> Yeah. But I do hear some students like, like a remote course, especially some students already have kids, right? So, I mean, it's more convenient for them to take yeah. care of their kids at home. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so it, there's pros and cons for sure, yeah. So, Da, can you, um, so I have a question and I want to see your opinion. So in uh, data science, Without the biology, just uh, learning data science generically, you can get a pretty decent salary after a uh, master program. So I would have presumed that the many students are not uh, motivated to learn additional biology and get into a research uh, and then get the lower salary. How do you keep them motivated to do bio KDD work? Uh, yeah, that's that's a really difficult question. I mean, if you tell students, hey, this uh, you work on a certain kind of disease, right? So another is uh, self-driving cars, right? So a lot of students will choose the other. Uh, uh, but I think uh, we need to, uh, I mean, you, you need to find them really motivated students, interesting science, right? If they are just uh, 
interesting, cool stuff. And uh, then, then, I mean, uh, if you, you, you ask them to work on, along the science direction, it's still very difficult for them. They will be painful. So really, I think the key thing is to identify, talk to enough students, identify those that really have interest in this direction. And uh, like they, they really want to, uh, like, like uh, let's, it's for example, the COVID-19, right? So if we can uh, contribute anything to uh, battling the COVID-19, it will be very meaningful. But again, so not it's not for everyone, especially if you look at, I, I learned that for Facebook, if you, you, you pass an interview, you get to Facebook, so, the salary, like at least double my salary right now. So, so it's kind of <laughs> difficult. I mean, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so you have to motivate them uh, on something that's other than money. Yeah, definitely. If it's yeah. just the money, uh, but, but you can also promote in a way of like a, uh, like a life balance, right? So, because if you look at the IT industry, it's a very fierce competition. And there could be layoff easily if you look at uh, like Uber, uh, like COVID nineteen has triggered a lot of layoff, right? So, but I do think, uh, yeah. So, so it's more like uh, the lifestyle that you should promote, or like a more. Uh, if you just look at the money, then then it's difficult. And and if you look at the technology, it's actually make people uh, easier to use things. Right? As we look at second lens these days, previous people use Wicca, like those kind of difficult tools. Now it's just a call, uh, get your model, call a uh, fit and uh, call predict, right? So the three lines, you get everything. So, so Python library is making more and more easy. If you look at, uh, uh, look at data science, it's really deeply coupled with Python libraries, right? Previously people think Python is slow, but now every Python library is actually written in C down there. So speed is not an issue. It's more like a shell that is smart, right? So and uh, the more important thing is how to make people easily use these tools. And uh, my understanding about data science is just a, because data science is not a deep, deep direction. It's like a flat direction. You have so many different kind of models. You want mm. to see them and work on the projects, right? Whether visualization, whether machine learning, deep learning, deep learning itself has so many directions. Right? So uh, it's more like people are keep learning, but it's on the same plane. It's not uh, going deeper. And because these tools are making things not so deep. Right, so it's a Python API wrapping some deep tools uh, that you can direct call, you know, what's the input, what's the output. And I think uh, that's also a opportunity for, for, uh, for informatics, right? So because these tools have been now so user friendly, it's right the time for a lot of uh, people in biology and, you know, uh, in biomedicine to study a little bit of the data science because it's gonna be way, way, way easier than if you think about like C++, for example, right? So, uh, you don't even care about all those low-level uh, programming ideas. You just, um, it, it's more like a data science is kind of different from computer science, right? So now you put more on like a uh, statistic analytic side, machine learning side, and less on those kind of traditional computer science uh, architecture, right? so those kind of stuff. So yeah, this might be. Okay. Well, uh, I just uh, quickly created a poll, and I don't know whether um, we can just uh, try to have fun and uh, and answer that. Uh, I'm gonna actually just enter this poll. This would be my first time using the poll anywhere. That's from uh, uh, UAB. So bear with me. Uh, Where's the chat window? Oh, just the chat window is uh, right near the screen share. Share screen button. Yeah, I'll click button at the bottom of the, oh, at the bottom application. Of the yeah, I think I have just, okay. What I'm seeing is a chat for my other meetings and not for this meeting. Uh, So can someone type in the in the chat so I can find where that window is now? Yeah, I, I'm typing. Yes. Sir. Oh no. So I, let me let me make it. Uh, I just uh, type it hard. Oh okay.
uh, poleve.com forward slash Are you able to see the poll or? I need to log in. Let me check. Okay. Um, maybe I wasn't sharing the right uh, poll address. Uh, da, I'm gonna actually just share this. Uh, have you used a poll e everywhere? It says respond at poleeve.com forward slash Jake Chen. I've already activated this. And yes. Yeah, I actually uh, went to the, the link and uh, typed my name. And then uh, I see a black screen say please log in with SSO. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should write it for account to do that. Maybe. Oh, uh, actually, I. I when I click, actually, it gave me a UAB a login. So I'm not sure whether for other people they will have their institution login. I have so, the same interface. So you're saying that the people have, okay, so copy response link. And I'm trying to see if uh, it. Yeah, it's, it's, like a, it's a link. Please log in with SSO. And if you click this underscore the login with SSO, it will. Uh, pop you up to a login. And in my case, it's actually direct me to the UAB, uh, you know, the dual security check and then authentication. But I'm not sure what will happen with the other people. But Jack from the... What about the, this link? Uh -huh. Oh, I see. The second. Oh, it's the same. It's the same. Oh, I can, I can somehow just uh, see it. You see my screen if I use this? Oh, it's because I already re uh, logged in. But in, the, in your previous page, it says this is deactivate. Okay, so if you actually follow the second link. I see the same login request. So, so uh, where where is the login request that direct me to? Perhaps uh, this is for UAB only, and uh, you can't really pull this unless uh, people are logged in as individuals. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm in there, but I need to I need to verify through the, our institution. Uh, yeah, I now see see it. Uh, Okay, so maybe this is not a really uh, nice tool for people across the different organizations. This is a better tool for within an organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think maybe we can just look at the questions and uh, yeah, put the uh, answer in the chat. Well, I take on biology problems simply, well, one is I had the biology background before. And so I know that biology is very different from physics. 
and chemistry. And the physics is driven by first principles and the chemistry more or less uh, uh, the, the molecule don't have a brain and it's a following principles. But biology has so many hierarchies mm -hmm. and uh, at the highest level, you can use uh, rules and reasonings. Um, and there are so many uh, special cases that even just studying a special case and find a special case is pretty much rewarding in life. You don't have to actually find the ultimate one principle, one theory that explains everything mm -hmm. to be recognized. So that's fascinating to me. Of course, and when I study biology for long enough and I look at everything else, I, I thought, oh, in finance and e-commerce is relatively easy because it's a man-made system. Mm -hmm. It hasn't evolved to the extent of uh, complexity of biology. So anything that I learned from biology, if I bothered, <clears throat> I could actually apply it to finance. But, but that's just me. But I think you are right. I think it is interesting in the sense that it's very complex. <laughs> yeah, in the case of a coronavirus, though, I wasn't thinking about the complexity. I was thinking, oh, <clears throat> there are so many data. And even biologists in my institution would take months before they can collect some data. By the time, it will probably be too late. So uh, getting the data from outside of the organization and do something that seems to be the advantage of a data scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, what I found is that the, there is a very quick evolution of the complexity in the past uh, eight or nine months. At the very beginning, the problem seems to be so easy and if you get the one viral sequence and you can blast it, you can do comparison, <clears throat> it's almost like bioinformatics in going back 30 years. Uh, and then it's so easy, I have to pick up the book and uh, learn something back. But then very quickly, you understand there's more and more data and the biology has evolved. So it started to get interesting. And then to the point that nowadays, even if you know everything, you have to work together and specialize, work together with all different expertise to publish good paper. Now it's all about specialty. So the, I, I, would, I witnessed the, the evolution of research topic within COVID-19 seemed to be a shortened evolution of how computer science, data science can help contribute the overall biomedical research. We see in this eight months, what we would have seen in 80 years. <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating. Two. Mm. So Dad, uh, have you thought about the format for next year? So it seems that the, the virtual format would allow us to get people who wouldn't want, normally want to go to KDD because of the cost or time constraint. Um, well, I think we can make it hybrid, for example, but I'm not sure whether it will work out with uh, uh, you know, KDD organizers. And uh, so, uh, 
again, next year is uh, quite uncertain yet. Yeah. So, uh, but maybe we can share like uh, in the meanwhile we can give uh, like a both tracks. Right? So, if uh, people who want to uh, just uh, come and uh, listen to the talks, I think we can we can make a, for example, uh, use Zoom to to share the talks in the meanwhile yeah, on our we, screen. We, we should yeah. talk about uh, how to really support. Uh, we want to build a community. I felt that the people who want to learn for a day, uh, we can either make a free or just charge a very nominal fee for them to come in. And setting up a Zoom is not difficult, uh, even when we go back to a regular format. KDD care about people who come to the conference, whether they add additional workshop to their registration fee or not. So I think at least if we have regular session that people can submit paper, get published and be included in the special issue and then there's a regular, uh, the core. <clears throat> that could be a small core, maybe 10 papers each year. Those people will pay for the whole registration of the workshop, maybe the conference then KDD will be okay. What they don't want in the past is this, uh, that we have a workshop and people don't even pay the conference fees. And then they come here and they leave. So we make no contribution to the conference. That would not be, be good. If we take care of the basic business and we want to expand the, the outreach, I felt that, that they are very open. I, I did attend the, uh, several tutorials yesterday mm -hmm. and uh, more than half, I would say six, seven, 60, 70 percent of the tutorial I attended already have YouTube channels outside of KDD. Yeah. And they just have the, uh, the organizers themselves put in the, uh, um, the YouTube content. They also have their website. I felt that the, the knowledge dissemination is always in the open. And when, uh, if people want to come here, they come here for the ability to ask questions, the ability to network. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is what I'm thinking. So for the regular track where KDD really cares about registration, we, we can keep it, right? So people submitting the papers. And then we can also have invited speakers just like the one we have today. And we can also have people who can just log on and Zoom, and even for invited people who, who are renowned but who cannot afford to travel because of the schedule, then we, we can also make it uh, kind of like in this form. Because when you travel, it's not one day, right? it's, it's one week or something, a, a, a couple of days. Right? And uh, so uh, I think we can make it hybrid and also a lot of students, right? so if they want to join, we can make it uh, just a Zoom link so you can come and listen and also talk to the presenters. I think it's the, the, the YouTube video thing, uh, this actually, I think in, in computer science, like uh, I, I attended the uh, ICD because I have two papers there and I also uh, chaired uh, a session uh, in Sigma and I find that people are, all of them are just playing videos. So this is actually required by computer science uh, committee uh, that if it's virtual, just a, just a record the video and play it. And uh, so because of this reason, if you think about it, if I already, Make the video, right? Why I not just upload it to the YouTube channel? But a lot of times there's a concern. Right? So when you have the copyright transfer, some of somewhere they will say, "Hey, uh, only ACM can hold the video copyright and so, something like this." So, so, uh, but I'm not sure. So, so, but I see a lot of people still doing that. So if you have your own YouTube channel and just upload that and as a window, right? So because it's it's even better than the conference. You think about it, most of the people who study your paper are not only those maybe tens of people, dozens of people in the room listening to the talk. It could be like the people also in your community but not attending the talk, right? So, and then if you have a YouTube channel there with your videos, it's like uh, stay there forever. People see your paper, and they, they, they want to get a quick idea, they can just look the two minute video. And I, I think that that's even better in broaden the participation, you, you use your efforts for them, right? So you don't have to present it a hundred times to everywhere, I say. 
Yeah, so, so I think that that's the reason, including that tutorial. Now that they have made the two hours tutorial, why not just make it online? And uh, even for training their students, for example, about a domain, they just say in the future, I say, hey, you just watch that video. Like, or you, if you recruit new PhD student, you say, hey, watch that video, and uh, after two hours, uh, you should know something, and you come back, and that's your interview. That's it. So that's way easier than you talk to them again and again. Yeah. Yeah, it really changes the format of future learning. The learning will have to be done more efficiently. That means mm -hmm. each iteration of research will become shorter and shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether it's a good or a bad thing. So that will keep us busy competing with the best and the brightest. But what's the time for writing proposals and getting us funded? Uh, what's your opinion? <laughs> Uh, the two of you, do you feel like it's more challenging to get funding, juggle between funding and research done, or you have a secret uh, formula? Uh, so, so can, can you repeat your question again? So, what, so what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, the current way of working, at least uh, through KDD, is yeah. that um, more people are sharing their um, knowledge, papers, scripts online for yeah. others to pick up almost instantaneously. Yeah. So given that this is a global race and a lot of people are in Europe and China competing, so I see this pace of innovation and research becoming faster and faster. Yeah. But our speed in writing grant proposal is steady, is constant. Yep. So how do you actually compete as a, a maybe younger faculty, junior faculty, to keep up with the race of getting funded while at the same time doing research and become successful? Do you find it harder? You have to work maybe more hours or there's any smarter ways to manage this race? Oh, okay. So, so uh, my experience with that. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so if you talk to it's like uh, my peers in uh, they say, like I choose US, right? So a lot of people choose to go back to China uh, after their PhD, for example. And there's a difference is that I see they have twenty or thirty students, and then they become super productive, and uh, like the citations, the papers, are, like uh, triples me every year. Right. So, so definitely there are the difficulties there uh, because uh, our students are way more expensive than, than people from, let's say, uh, like uh, Asia or, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere else, right? So, and the, actually the students there are also very smart, I can say. So a, a lot of times uh, you need to pay less attention to teach them. And they, uh, frankly speaking, what my feeling is that it, uh, now actually what I do is uh, because I cannot afford so many funding with students, right? So, but uh, my capacity is a little bit larger. So I work with uh, maybe some students in, uh, from abroad, but uh, you know, it's uh, like a collaboration, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, because I cannot afford uh, to take all of them here and maybe they also target very top universities in the US, for example, right? So, uh, so my, my trade-off is that you, uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, like more collaborations and uh, uh, don't limit to only within the group is maybe a good uh, solution. And uh, in the meanwhile, I train my students uh, really hard. I mean, when they come, I do, actually I, I teach my students for the entire summer, every, every week. And, and I'm super busy actually in the summer this time. And, uh, but uh, what I have, this is uh, what I have to do because if you have, let's say many students and they are not trained up yet, you find, uh, let's say, uh, they have a lot of loopholes in the college education. You need to fill that these holes and they, they can smoothly uh, transfer to research. Right? So if they, they have those loopholes, they don't even know an important concept, you think it's a common sense, then, then that's gonna be crazy. Right? So, in the future. So, so I do do a lot of training to my own students. Huh. So I see Jeffrey here. Uh, Jeffrey, are you uh, able to talk? And uh, so you're very super productive and I'm sure that uh, a lot of people will come to your talk when it's time. Uh, can you give some comments how you manage to do so many different things across uh, many areas of computer science and become productive? 
I guess I work hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's true. Yeah. One thing you <clears throat> commented on students. We don't have any students, as far as I know. Well, very not PhD students. I haven't seen a new PhD student in three years. Really? Wow. So you're able to manage it all with the master students and? No, I don't think master students are very productive. I don't work. Uh, I, I have many master students ask me, but I don't. But they're all doing courses. Because they're all here to get their industry jobs, are they not? Even the summer PhD students are getting industry jobs. They, I had, I only had one PhD student here this summer. The other three were at Microsoft and Facebook. Yeah. Well, actually, they were in blue. They weren't there. They were all virtual, but they were working for Microsoft and Facebook. Yeah, so we were talking earlier uh, about the concern that uh, few people are interested in getting into this uh, double jeopardy area. So the, <laughs> the biology and data science. So we're, we're faced with very limited uh, talent getting into the field. Um, what is your advice to younger people here? Should they just rely on their interests only or is it because that we're not painting the picture better for them? <clears throat> well, I would say that the applications of machine of deep learning or machine learning are probably the most promising area. Uh, and there's because those there are many applications that have not been explored. So I think and that in, and of course biology has a huge number. So I think that's a good area to go into. Another yeah. thing I've noticed over the last 10 years every single PhD student of mine has ended up working for industry. <laughs> Whereas that was not true the previous 10 years. Previous 10 years, most of them went to universities. Yeah. And so, but in the last 10 years, I, some, well, they have no, some have worked for DOE labs, but they're either working for industry or DOE labs. So you probably can sense it the most, uh, but do you feel that this means that in the future, uh, we're switching back to the, the time when IBM, at and Bell Labs lead the, the, the applied research? Uh, so for data science- Well, I think that's been, but it's not IBM, it's Google, Facebook, yeah, yeah. Amazon, et cetera, Microsoft. Those are leading, clearly leading not just applied research, I would say they're leading okay. fundamental research. Right. Yeah, I see that Google has a quantum computing at the top, you know, so they are working on everything. From it. So they have all the data. Uh, for example, maybe for us, we need to do any prediction or reserve. They just look at what happened in the last week this time, they, they get the data. Right? So it's, a, it's totally different uh, foundations and their yeah, hardware. And, I think it's just the, the, the age, right? So this, this age is- Actually, coming. I think we have to work more with industry. It's our only chance. Yeah. Industry has such huge resources. Exactly. Yeah, so. We can't compete. We have to work with them. Because we are doing things, we can offer things that they don't have. Um, so, because they're pretty focused. I mean, I, in the talk I'm giving, I'll discuss a bit about time series. Well, the, that in the in industry, that's dominantly a couple of areas, mainly mainly connected to speech. But the number of application areas of time series is enormous. But in this, but also right hailing, right hailing, and and um, and natural language processing, but. Or the medical uh, medical time series, then they're not. They do some. They indirectly do some work in those, but not not with the same intensity. So I think academia is very competitive, but you better choose what you're doing. And what's what's different from the past is that the industry is now dominant in fundamental research, because I think most of the fundamentals in deep learning have come from industry. 
um, at least recently, maybe not originally, but now it is recently as they've come from industry. And the, compared to when I used to be doing, say, parallel computing, when industry was a nearly not nearly competitive with academia, the difference is that it, there are fields of there are commercial opportunities where the importance of deep learning is so enormous and has so many tens or hundreds of billions of dollars attached to it, industry can afford to spend unlimited money on it. In fact, they have to spend unlimited money on it because otherwise somebody else will win. So and that wasn't true in the past, not even I mean, the only area that maybe industry was really dominant, sort of slightly dominant was databases, but most other areas of computing, academia was dominant. So would it be fair to say that if someone wants to succeed in academia, choosing a domain area such as this and be more problem oriented will probably have a higher chance of success? Well, actually, I think that's true everywhere. It's just that, because industry is actually not so exciting. I mean, they are only doing one of a few problems. They just, so I think the most interesting problems are the applications. And those will motivate changes in the fundamental area. But at the moment, industry still dominates. But I think, I think the applications are, uh, uh, pretty promising and we can be very competitive in applications. Yeah, and I also think that the industry, they, they kind of they open source everything. Right? So if you spend a lot of time and finally they have a true, true trend model that is super powerful. And uh, I mean, it's difficult to compete. They, they immediately like uh, catch up and- uh, Well, of course, industry has huge amounts of computing. Yeah. And even today, I was trying to get some new results for your, my talk and Google Colab, which is the only resource I really have, it's been broken or its performance is terrible. <laughs> so I haven't been able to run a job for the last eight hours since I got up. Well, I got some for a couple of hours and it stopped. <laughs> but uh, we have nothing competitive to Colab, in my opinion, at, at IU competitive to Colab. Yeah, uh, I'm also quite surprised how they, they have so many cloud uh, like GPUs. So they, it's like they unli have unlimited money. <laughs> like, well, I've told you it's because every click from every every person in the in whatever there are seven billion people in the unit in the in the world, each of those generates money to pay pay for these computers. I see. Yeah, so, so we have a tremendous change in the. Um, amount of re resources that can go into both the computer infrastructure and computer research. Yeah. So what, what I do now with Colab is really just to put everything on GitHub and then tell students, hey, just to use that GitHub link to create a Colab and then play with it. So you don't even need to install a notebook on their mm -hmm. computer or, you know, that's kind of uh, terrifying. <laughs> a little bit. So it's like you, you have three GPUs and, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's really crazy. <laughs> yeah well that i don't know how the maybe this is a government's uh, job to figure out how to get a portion of the tax dollars back into the research and really increase the research funding if they're increasing the revenue not sharing with academia and academia talents are getting drained then how are we gonna sustain uh, quantum computing or the future uh, generation of uh, data science yeah. research? But even if you look at quantum computing, it's not so obvious how many universities can compete. Yeah. I don't think Indiana University stands a chance. It, you need such infrastructure to be competitive in quantum computing. I mean, you can do a few theoretical studies, which is what they do, but um, and they do some in physics, but that's not really competitive. How can it be competitive? Right. Huh. Um, I mean, there are some of the largest universities, a few are competitive, but not, 
that's an area like um, building chips or something where it's very hard to compete from in, from you know from a tradition from an average you know standard university. Well, at least in medicine, what I see is that uh, there's a general medicine practice that's uh, been uh, uh, taken up by big pharmaceutical companies, big healthcare company, big uh, medical record company. But the personalization of medicine actually will give the power back to the individuals. The personalization means that you have to collect the individual data of just a patient that you see, you perform the diagnostic. Everyone's case is slightly different. And the big companies may not uh, care about this smaller, but very heterogeneous long tail uh, market. And then that's where the majority of people work. So, um, in biology, you can see every research lab studying a very subtle, special type of tumor. They're going to thrive and they'll get uh, some funding to study it. They'll get the data and then you can, if you can combine the public data with their data, and then there's a viable research program. But don't you need enough generic data to train the models and things? Yeah, you do, you do need uh, some generic model, but you also need to tweak it to make it work and make many decisions. Um, but that general model will come from either right. the, either from NIH or Broad Institute or, or right. from industry. Right. And probably it's the general model which will build in the important assumptions that um, may not even allow you to study some diseases? Um, it, it varies from the disease to disease, right? So in, uh, in certain diseases like mental disorders, and there's, there's not even a consensus on the common treatment. And mental disorders and the one that is most common probably only shared 2% commonality. And then the, the long tail is 98%. So that represents a lot of opportunity for individual treatment. But in other diseases, uh, like inflammation, like even for coronavirus, we see a lot of variations, but 80% of the chances, then you can just apply one treatment and then take care of the one with accessions in critical care and then uh, give and take some tailored treatment. So, it, yeah. So we, we also was one, uh, we were discussing the future format of this uh, BioKDD. Uh, do you feel like uh, within the ACM, there's a strong presence in the special interest group in computational biology and bioinformatics? I'm afraid I'm not part of that, so I wouldn't know. Okay, yeah, I don't think that they are, even though they do have a special chapter, the, uh, the transaction journal is what we're publishing on every year, but I don't think that they are connecting actively with with AMIA or ISMB, uh, those other active community doing bio-related work. Well, so, there is, I apologize hi. to interrupt you. There is a special interest groups in bioinformatics and bio and uh, the computational biology that is SIG Bio, the ACM. Uh, it's, it's a much more a newsletter more than, but it's a matter of uh, choice that has been, uh, um, uh, I glided from the beginning. It's the special interest groups of the ACM BCB, the, 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 the conference that is an annual one. But it's, I mean, it's, it's a cross community, much more coming from database community, something like uh, 10 years, uh, um, started 10 years ago, something like in 2010. I, I'm currently the editor of the newsletter, so this is why I'm. Uh, oh, great. 
Yeah. Well, maybe we should uh, work together uh, in the future. Yeah. Um, it will be great. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, Bio KDD next year will be 20 years. I'm thinking about doing a, a review uh, and then just talk to about people about the shifting topics and also uh, want to look for the next 10 years where this field is going to be. Okay. This is currently my first year, but I'm um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, I mean to, to participate and uh, excited also to to stay here. Well, hope to meet you soon. I mean, in presence, all of you. But it's amazing the, the you know the quantity of uh, useful information that 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 I just figured out uh, in, uh, in 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 two three hours of. Uh, listening and having a look so it's uh please do not hesitate if you think that you know um, by myself or even other colleagues you can you know uh, take some useful information to uh, um, let bio kdd growing up uh, again so yeah so uh I uh, I just uh, shared my email address. Uh, would you mind sending me an email reminder, and then we can have a separate meeting talk about it. I think we we are just uh, one minute uh, from uh, Jeffrey's uh, keynote presentation now. Uh, yeah, let's just uh, come back to that. I see the colleagues. I mean, just what I was. Uh, I think that was useful to to share with you such an information. Okay, great. Da, are you the chair or someone else is the chair? Uh, I'm the chair, yeah. 